Hey, deserving listeners, a lot of you, and I mean a lot of you, have been asking me to react to this documentary on HBO called The Curious Case of Natalie Grace. I have no idea what this documentary is about. It looks like there's a young child involved, I'm not sure. My name is Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. Let's watch. They say, hey, we know you. We've seen your home study. We know that you have a charity for special needs children. You've been doing that for a decade. We think you'd be perfect for this little girl that's going to be coming to us. She's a little person, she has dwarfism. Now, here's the problem. You got 24 hours to decide. So I've been watching and actually keeping notes. I also noticed at the beginning of the documentary was basically a teaser portion and I don't like that because it spoils everything, so I just skipped over it. And now I think we're getting to the point where we're going to meet Natalie Grace, who they adopt. And just to keep you up to date on what I have heard from the individuals being interviewed, primarily the adoptive father by the name of Michael Barnett, they apparently, according to him, Michael, they had a picture-perfect life, a Norman Rockwell sort of life. They had been married 15 years, Michael and Christine. They had a huge house, 5,000 square feet. They had nice cars, a Lamborghini, looked like an old Corvette. Everything was perfect. They had three sons, Jacob, Wesley, and Ethan. The oldest son, Jacob. Jacob is on the autism spectrum, and he was called a genius. He was on 60 Minutes because he was so smart. He, I think, was skipping grades, and everything was perfect. And then the family also started a charity for special needs kids, and they thought about adopting children, seemingly out of the goodness of their own heart, I don't know, and they were looking to adopt. They tried to adopt a child from Haiti, and that didn't work, and then this adopted adoption agency reaches out to Michael and Christine to see if they want to adopt this individual, and they have 24 hours to make a decision. So up until this point, it's all just a normal story of a family that is heading into possibly adopting a child. She's truly frightened, and she just doesn't know what she's seeing and what's going on. She says, Michael, Michael, look. Look down. And Natalia had full pubic hair. And I don't know what to think. Is that possible? Is that even possible? Okay, well, that can happen rarely. Also, we have to take their word for it, so, huh. Well, uh, I don't know. Wait, so, well, I'll keep watching. Tell me what's going on. Natalia, tell that happened. Okay. And I can remember her, her, her physicalness at the time. Her hands were just out in front of her like this. And she said, well, I have a period. And I've been hiding it. All right, so I'm going to take a guess and say that she, Natalia, is not actually six years old because the show, this documentary, I'm going to take a guess and hope that they would not exploit an actual six-year-old who had some anomaly biologically that would result in them having those kinds of developments at that young age. We know that she was, ad or at least they were told that she was adopted from Ukraine, I believe. And I, I just don't know what's going on right now. Christine, that's not possible. Chris found some socks that she had used in her underwear. So another notable thing about the documentary is that Christine, the adoptive mother, is not in the documentary. She's not being interviewed in the documentary. It's only the father, Michael. And I'm wondering why that is. Is it that she doesn't want to participate? Is it that the documentarians are waiting to reveal her later? Do the documentarians not want her involved? Is she still alive? Is she in prison? Or so? I don't know. We see it. Suddenly, she fills her cheeks with air, blows them out a little bit, so the definition in her cheekbones disappears. So, that starts to happen. We literally see her head change. It's almost like, you got me. Okay, so 
the adoptive father, Michael, he is claiming that Natalia knew how old she was and was actively trying to deceive the parents. And if I heard a client that was referred to me that was doing this, my first hypothesis would be that the child was worried that they were not going to be adopted and were presenting themselves as younger. In fact, I think I might have even ran into that at times. Because there are some people who are born in some very chaotic circumstances in which there are no records as to how old they are, whether it's because they come from a region of the world that doesn't keep records or they come from a region of the world in which there is ongoing war and any documentation of the birth has been destroyed or forgotten or misplaced or something. And there can be times when by the time you adopt a kid, you just don't really know. There's also some cultures around the world that don't really regard birthdays in the way that we do in the United States. They think of birthdays as being like, well, you were born at some point around this year or something. So my first hypothesis would be that she doesn't really know how old she is and or she's terrified that she's going to be rejected. But I'm guessing that isn't the story because I'm noticing there's a number of episodes in this documentary and the amount of requests that I've received to watch this indicate it can't. So there's got to be something really salacious about the story. So if I was to take a guess, well, it seems like they're heading in a direction where she knows she's older and she's got to be significantly older because if she were like 13, uh, I guess that would be pretty salacious. But what if she were, I don't know, in her 20s or something and she was adopted, uh, she conned an adoption agency into believing that she was much younger and she was an orphan of some sort. I don't know. That would be interesting. Is that what this is about? We thought, how wonderful would it be for you to hear your native language, your native tongue for the first time in a couple of years? The woman from the Ukraine comes in and just immediately starts speaking Ukrainian. I swear on all things holy, Natalia's never heard a word of Ukrainian in her life. All right, so they're seemingly building a case that there's a lot of lies. Now, we weren't given, and I don't think the parents were given information about the adoption. Were they told that she was directly from Ukraine? Because if not, she could be from Ukraine, but was raised in a different country where they didn't speak Ukrainian or it's traumatic for her to remember the language. So just the fact that she didn't respond when she's spoken to in Ukrainian, that doesn't really say much necessarily, but I don't know. The documentary seems to be heading in a direction, so maybe that's what they're telling us is that it's another lie. Lack of trust. Uh, So that, you know, compounded. So you lied to him. Okay, so that's what you're going to be in the most trouble for. You don't lie. Natalia did have behavioral issues, which... Okay, so we're going to hear about lying and that. So the way that they're framing this is that Christine, the mother, was talking with Natalia about lying about maybe her age and where she's from. And that would not be something I would do. (laughs) I wouldn't confront a child. There's something going on here because... It's not just a child lying about like, no, I didn't eat the cookie, it was my brother. Certainly the adoption process must be traumatic. I mean, abandonment issues are a thing and Natalia was abandoned multiple times. She was with another family in America before she came with us. Okay, interesting. So she was with another family. Now it could have been a foster family or an identified temporary family. Natalia was with us for months. And that's when we start to witness her dark side. We had uh, a 2007 Jeep Commander, it has three rows of seats. Okay, so it looks like we're heading into a list of allegations or claims by the father, which I just have to say that we don't know if Michael, the adoptive father, is a reliable narrator. There would be potentially, particularly 
post hoc, there would be a lot of reasons why an adoptive father would frame things in a certain way or even invent things. But the other thing is, is they're not immediately going into talking about the previous parents. So maybe we have to wait for that. But Natalia would always try to sit next to my youngest, the smallest, my six-year-old Ethan, and she would do whatever she could to upset him. She would purposely wait until she was next to him in the car, and then she would do her best to urinate on him. She would defecate in the car and put her hand into it and try to smear it on Ethan. Well, so if this is even 50% true, yeah, that's obviously very concerning. If you're a parent or a human being, you would be very concerned for that other child. Sibling on sibling abuse is a thing. Uh, kids can be really cruel. Even siblings that love each other can be cruel. So imagine if you had a sibling that was out to get you, right? So we're hearing that. And also just the involvement of feces would raise this question about the potential severe nature of abuse that Natalia had gone through. Because you, you don't see that kind of behavior from people unless it, you know, uh, well, I don't know the research, but if I heard of anybody you doing this kind of thing, I would think that early in life, maybe even during potty training, that there was severe abuse or neglect. Yeah, it was a frequent occurrence for Natalia to soil surfaces that she wasn't supposed to. Okay, so whenever I am hearing people give their account, particularly if it's fairly fantastical as the one that Michael is giving the father, I'm always looking for corroboration. Because if you just have one person saying something, you know, it says something, but it says something more if you have corroboration. So we have the, the son, the oldest kid, who incidentally still lives with the dad, so take that for what it's worth. But you have a third party, a, a, an observer, who is also claiming that Natalia would do these things. What were you doing to bother Ethan? I was sparking. Did you keep doing it while you were in a car with him? That was the life my six-year-old son had. To get into the car was like going through the haunted house. The other thing I noticed as they were telling the story and showing pictures was that of the three sons, only the oldest son's face was non-blurred. The other two boys, Wesley and Ethan, I believe, they had their faces always blurred out, which makes me think that they're not involved in the documentary. So. I don't know, it's, it's just, I'm trying to <laughs> predict what's happening here. Now, what I will say is I have treated people, both children and adults, who will present with this behavior of smearing feces on things. It often is a way of protesting for individuals. It can also be some kind of complex around potty training or around their own products, if you will. There's potentially a Freudian thing to it. You know, Freud's theories, of which there are many, uh, this sort of theory seems to maybe hold some water. It's hard to research this kind of thing. But anyway, so for these individuals, the clinical way to look at it is that they are having some troubles emotionally, and they're having trouble verbalizing or communicating or feeling safe enough to communicate their protest. So what you try to do with those individuals, even if they're adults, is to help them to feel safe enough to tell you, because usually they're, they're trying to tell you something, they're trying to communicate, and they don't believe that anyone will hear it, or they're so hurt that they feel it is justified to take this extreme, ac this extreme action and they don't have other means to do so. So that's, that's what I'm hearing. And you know, another thing, if we went someplace in public, and she made eye contact with somebody. We would climb into the car, she would get into the car, she'd get in her seat, she'd close the door. As soon as I would start to get into my seat and the car would get into gear, doors open and she's throwing herself out of the vehicle so people around her can see. Huh, that's interesting. I, it's interesting the way they're editing this documentary. They are showing a fair amount of real footage that doesn't coincide with the story they're telling. You know, they might be telling a story about her and 
she is saying something, you know, Michael said, and then she said this, and they're, they're showing actual footage of her, which I just hope that the allegations from Michael are at least somewhat believable. Otherwise, you're really leaning on Natalia, because if these allegations aren't accurate or there's reasons to believe they're not accurate, the documentarian should be careful about the sort of associations they're making. But anyway, particularly if we're talking about a child, I assume we're talking about a child. I don't know. But either way, someone who has been through some difficult times in all likelihood. So we're hearing that she would throw herself out of the car and try to get sympathy from strangers. So on one hand, you think in terms of the Michael narrative is that you have a a child who has been abused and has distorted views of authority and parents and maybe will be defiant in a lot of concerning ways, which incurs a fair amount of discipline or privileges being taken away and she feels very put upon or something and is trying to get sympathy from others? Is it a manipulation to try to get back at the parents? Or if we were a fly in the wall, would we agree that Natalia had reasons to try to flee from the family? We're only hearing from the family's perspective, so who knows what was really happening, right? The idea, look, a poor helpless little girl, and she was trying to get back to poor helpless little girl status. She was doing as many things as possible to cause hurt or harm or mental distress to the entire family. Okay, so Michael seems to be implying that her whole shtick or con is to make everyone feel sorry for her. And if that's where this is headed, that's that's pretty interesting. And at this time, my boys are 6, 9, and 11. Natalia would find things that were important to them, like a Hot Wheel car, She'd hide them, she'd wait to be crossing the street, she would throw them into the street and make sure the boys saw it. She was baiting my kids to run in the traffic so they'd get run over. Wow, if that's true, my goodness. Again, we can't know, my dogs are barking, if it's accurate, but yikes. It, it's one. Th- okay. It's horrible to smear your own feces on your brother. It's a whole other thing to try to cause events that would result in the serious injury or death of your sibling, which on rare occasions I have treated kids and adults who have these behaviors. We have ways of framing this personality-wise. We'll call them psychopaths or they suffer from antisocial personality disorder. There are other conceptualizations as well, but you know, I've treated some individuals that are like this. And it is disturbing to be around them, particularly if they still have a lot of the behaviors. I've helped some people actually with their behaviors such that they don't necessarily develop empathy, but they learn how to account for empathy and stay out of trouble. Because the thing is, is if you're suffering from antisocial and you lack empathy for other people, you lack the awareness of harm to other people, you don't necessarily care about harm to other people, then as you're behaving in the world, you're going to harm a lot of people, either because you don't think about their feelings or you actually kind of like to harm others. And what will end up happening is what goes around comes around and there's a lot of consequences to them. And they don't really understand how that whole thing works. So for some of these children, they can be neglected in this way and harmed during those critical years and have some very, very concerning behavior and lack of empathy. So it's possible that Natalia, but again, we're taking Michael's, he's, he's, he's the main, there are other, there have been a few other people that have chimed in, but most of the behavior allegations are from the father. Now, it's also possible that the behaviors were behind closed doors and the parents are really the only, now we haven't talked to the mom. I hope we get to talk to the mom. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. It's a new year, so of course it's time for New Year's resolutions. But often, those are just manifestations of internalized harmful voices, voices that tell us we're not good enough. So instead of making a resolution to change something, let's recognize that we are already good enough. Now, most people think of therapy as a place for us to work on our problems, 
But there are several schools of thought within the field of psychotherapy that adamantly reject that paradigm, like narrative therapy and solution-focused. Instead, these clinicians help us focus on what we're already doing well. And by helping us do that, data shows that we often will gravitate towards more beneficial patterns. Well, one place you can find such therapists is on BetterHelp. If you're thinking of starting therapy, it's definitely worth giving a try. So celebrate the progress you've already made. Visit betterhelp.com slash Kirk today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Kirk. I, I can't put in the words the everyday abject horror that we had to go through and live with. And there certainly was like a lot of fear. Like, what if Natalia it actually harms one of us? Yeah, again, we're taking just a few individuals word for it. But I will say, generally speaking, that this is a lot more common than I think people realize. I think a lot of times these individuals are narrativized as these devil children, right, from like a, a horror movie or something. And that's not an accurate way of looking at it. There's a variance to human behavior and personality, particularly when you start involving early childhood attachment disruptions and injury and abuse. And it's, it's more common than, than people. And there's also a spectrum uh, uh, regarding that behavior. Also, some kids will grow out of it. I have been fortunate enough to work with some kids who were in this direction, maybe not this bad, the, the ones I'm thinking, I have worked with kids like this and, and adults like this and, and much worse. But of the ones I'm thinking of, I did have the fortune of treating these individuals and families over, say, 10, 15 years and would meet the kid when he was 12, when the shit really hits the fan. And then I would see the stages of it and it might get worse as they age into like 16 because they start gaining more power in the world and more know-how to run away or sell drugs or they're bigger, they can um, you know, be physically imposing on the parents. And there's greater consequences if they commit a crime at that age, it holds with it a greater consequence. And so uh, they can fall into a different crowd, a pretty particularly uh, you know, a concerning crowd of people, gangs. This, you know, I would see all this stuff. And then the child would turn 18, things would get a little better. Uh, 19, 20, you know, a little better. By the time he's 25, 30 years old, uh, he still has issues, but he's completely, you know, 98% of the problems in terms of behavior have gone away. And so I've seen a lot of futures for kids or adults that will behave this way, particularly when you have enough treatment and a, a stable, you know, because the theory that I come from is that people don't want their lives to be, dif to be difficult, and they don't want to make other people's lives difficult, unless they're a sadist, and then that's different, or a psychopath who likes to con people. And we might be seeing a situation like that. But again, even psychopaths don't generally want their lives to be horrible. And so if you can teach them to work with the system so that they can get their needs met, then sometimes they'll, you know, I wouldn't recommend anyone marry these individuals, but they can participate in society. You could be a friend to someone like this, or you could be a coworker. You might even have friends or coworkers who are on the psychopathic spectrum, and they either figured out a way to make it work for them, or they went through enough treatment or something, or they had good enough parents. But uh, um, anyway, so I just want to say that. Uh, the other possibility is that all this is exaggeratory and wrong, and a lot of Natalia's behaviors were due to being mistreated even by the adoptive parents. I don't know. A couple of weeks after that, I came home from work. She had been taking knives out of the kitchen and hiding them in her room under her bed. I go upstairs. And of course, this whole narrative plays into a trope regarding little people that they're like some other species of animal and they're scary and they're creepy or something. It, 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 there's a, an association with twins that are like this. If, if you're a twin or you know twins, uh, they will attest to this notion that's in our culture that twins are creepy and they're they're otherworldly or they're magical or something, you know, like the twins in The Shining or something. And 
uh, for little people, it's a similar problem, if not worse. And so this depiction, the story, the horror music on you know that's edited in, uh, yeah, it, it sounds very, very scary if this is true. And I've had clients like this too. I've had kids, an adopted kid would get knives and stand over the parents, threaten them. These things happen, but I'm just kind of worried about the ongoing oppression and misunderstanding and stereotyping of little people. Christine has the knife. It was a big butcher knife. Natalia was hoarding knives in her room, had like intentions to attack us. I asked. So it could be an intention to use the knives. It also could be a safety thing. She might want to protect herself. I've worked with families who had kids that would do this sort of thing, and they might not be able to articulate why they're hoarding knives or other weapons, or they're too ashamed to reveal that they feel afraid. So that's another hypothesis. It's also, again, possible that she actually was hoarding the knives to kill people. But that wouldn't be my first assumption. I, my first assumption would be that the child is either afraid and is looking for some way to gain some power, some sort of safety, or the child is trying to intimidate by suggesting passively that they're murderous. Natalia, Natalia, did you have this under your bed? Yes. What were you gonna do with it? I'm going to kill you in your sleep. Well, okay, so assuming that Natalia actually did say that, which we can't know, then that's very concerning and should be addressed very thoroughly. I have been in situations like that. It's not only the right thing to do as a clinician and a human being, but it's also one of those areas that as a clinician, we can be effectively sued if we don't respond in a reasonable and robust manner. Whatever there's death on the line, right? Whether through homicide or suicide, there are protocols that we ha have to follow or at least consider to be considered having done a reasonable course of action to address the issue. So I, I've had situations like this and, and there's, a, there's a protocol of safety first, of trying to get to the heart of the matter, having a lot of procedures for the family about how to react, separating the child from the other kids, or at least making sure that the child is always monitored. Before I was a therapist, I, I had a child that was kind of in this category, and I was hired as a non-clinician to observe this kid 24, not 24 seven, but I was one of the people that had to observe him 24 seven, and this kid was very memorable. It's also possible that if I, my, so if I heard that a, a family member said this, you know, they're hoarding knives, and when asked said, I'm, I'm, I'm planning on killing you, I would address it as if it were a, a real threat, because better safe than sorry. But my assumption would be that it's not actually a real threat, that it's a gesture, some way of manipulating or getting what they want or they're bored or it was modeled to them or something like that. Again, I would address it, you know, better safe than sorry, but I wouldn't assume that death is around the corner. But we haven't heard from the wife. He referred to the, I don't know, I'm trying to predict the future. I should stop. The boys were like, yeah, yeah, this is really happening. Yeah. This, Natalia's really doing that. This is the time when I backed away from them because I was just in so much shock from hearing this story. I went to Grace and said, you know what, we need to find some new friends to play with. Yeah, I totally understand that. It's a very unfortunate thing that happens to families that are going through things like this, whether it's because of legitimate safety concerns for your own children, Grace, her child, or stigma or just not understanding the situation. It, it's a very isolating thing for uh, family and for parents to go through something like this. And I would be with the parents usually after they had been isolated from others. It's, it's really horrible, but you would understand 
a friend of the family saying, well, I don't know what's happening and I don't really have any control over what's happening, but until I'm reassured that everything is safe, my kids are not hanging out with your kids at all. And I don't want that kid over here. I'm not going to send my kid over to you. But for the family, it's, it's really rough because this compounds the problem, right? Because the, uh, the other kids in the household might be ostracized as well. And they suffer and the parents are already in a difficult spot. And now they have fewer friends, fewer support. You know, it could be very, very hard. And I've been with a lot of families as they've gone through that. Absolutely, we, we reached out to the adoption agency as we were noticing all of these issues and irregularities. Okay, yeah, that would be the first thing that parents would typically do is reach out to the adoption agency. And this is a message from Michael. My wife has been working the phones between everyone working her something. We are under unspeakable amounts of stress. I've returned a miss something. Christine is doing enough and is under enough stress personally. Please, you know, this is a, okay, well, uh, uh, yeah. So we reached out to the adoption agency. They were unhelpful. I was lost. I was yeah, I mean, depending on the program, the adoption agency wouldn't necessarily have the resources to help. I was lost. I was getting no help from anybody anywhere. So we went through a few therapists, trying to find guidance, trying to figure out the right diagnosis. Go inside. Okay, so that's good that he and the family went to some therapists, but... Unless the therapist has some expertise in this area, it's not likely to work because uh, it's a severe, particular kind of situation. Also, he says, I was looking for a diagnosis. If we, even if we think of her as an adult, but particularly if we think of her as a child, there isn't really a satisfying diagnosis when it comes to stuff like this. And even if we did have a diagnosis, it's not like there's a a treatment for these kinds of behaviors. I mean, there's a protocol and we have treatments that we typically will use, but it's not the sort of thing like if someone came to me with PTSD or with borderline personality or with avoidant attachment or with OCD or panic disorder, then there's a protocol, there's a lot of research, there's a lot of clients that come to therapy for this, a lot of people have been in research studies, a lot of therapists have been in research studies, and I have a very confident approach, as well as a lot of other therapists do, I'm not unique in this way, to those kinds of issues. But when it comes to this, there's not a lot that my field can do that will instill confidence or optimism in the family. You know, if they came to me, I would say, well, hearing what you're saying, there's a chance that she isn't actually the age that she is. And until we know that, it's hard to take a guess as to what's happening. But if we take a guess and say that she's somewhere in the teen years, then we are looking at potentially diagnoses of conduct disorder or antisocial personality disorder, because psychopathy isn't a diagnosis in the DSM, we wouldn't necessarily use that as the primary diagnosis. There are clinicians, and my, even myself, that will use that construct for sure, because it's a different sort of thing. It's more particular, perhaps more extreme than just antisocial personality disorder. But anyway, so I'd say uh, we could be looking at those kinds of labels. I, as a clinician, don't apply those labels unless I have enough time with someone to justify it. But given what you're saying, there's a possibility that that's what's going on. There's also a possibility that it's temporary and that it's acting out and that it's a plea, a cry for help. And that once she feels safe enough, then she won't exhibit this behavior as a possibility. But if we're looking at something more on the level of a pervasive personality issue that isn't likely to respond to treatment, at least very easily, then I, I, as a clinician, I have to tell you that there isn't a lot of optimism here. Is there a way forward? Yeah, a lot of that just depends on the resources available to you, what she decides to do, because if she wants to make everyone's lives miserable, then she can do that, right? And there's only so much you can do. I mean, you can't like chain her up to the radiator and force her to behave. Um, you know, that's 
uh, one of the things that is very disheartening to parents is when you realize that you just don't really have a lot of power over a child's behavior ultimately. That's why it's just so important to have a good relationship with your children and to protect your children from traumas so that it's not very difficult to shape a child's behavior, you know. When you have a good relationship with your 14-year-old and you have to go into their room and say, hey, it's time to put down the video games and get to your homework, the reason why that child will tolerate you saying that is because you love each other and you have goodwill. But if you don't have that, then there's not a lot of influence that you can exert on a child. It's really hard. So for, uh, you know, I would tell them this stuff and I would say uh, the recommendation is to provide you with a lot of resources so that you have respite from the parenting responsibilities of the child because there's only so much that two people can do to tolerate and handle everything. So uh, I would look into programs uh, where she can be watched or maybe even a specialized big sister program where the big sister can just take her out and go to the park or a movie or something just as a distraction. It's easier for a single adult with a single child to manage things than when you have your four kids at the home and the neighbors are coming over. So that can help. Also lowering your expectations, having measures in place that will reduce the risk, like literally not having knives. I, I've talked with families along these lines that, at least in the temporary, that they actually get rid of all sharp objects in their house, You know, whether it's a homicidal issue or a you know, a violent issue or a suicidal risk. Uh, there's measures that you can put in place to reduce the chance of harm where you can sleep a little easier at night, right? Getting locks on doors. We got to protect those other kids in the, in the home. We have to start ramping up the monitoring of the child's behavior. We have to do what we can so that the child isn't left unsupervised, particularly around other kids. And that will be the first order of business to eliminate the risk of harm to others. And then we're, we're looking at a long-term treatment protocol of trying to help her, uh, uh, well, I guess what I would say is assess the issue. And I might even suggest a specialist beyond myself. I would work with the family and the parents and the kids, but we might find a specialist to uh, work with the child that actually can assess competently whether or not conduct disorder or psychopathy or antisocial is indeed the construct of choice. So, you know, it's not a pretty picture. It's not, it's not like if, if a family brought to me a kid who is suffering from panic disorder, which has happened a number of times in my career, it's a much different story that I tell. <laughs> I say, okay, well, uh, in X amount of sessions, you know, maybe 15, maybe less, if the child participates meaningfully and you all participate in the family therapy to be helpful to the child, and we correct for whatever sort of issues resulted in the development of the panic, because sometimes panic disorder can result from some sort of trauma or even neglect, early life neglect, you know, a, a cold relationship between parents and kids. And I would lay all that out and I would say that, uh, you know, the chance of success, according to research, is, is pretty high. And once the panic disorder symptoms have receded, as long as the individual follows up with a, an ongoing maintenance regimen of self-awareness and potentially occasional sessions, then there's a pretty good chance that the panic disorder, if that's all we're looking at, will actually never come back. You know? So uh, there's, that's a much different <laughs> uh, uh, prognosis to a family than, than one here. And I find that for parents, initially, they think, oh, well, a therapist will be able to fix the problem, right? There's some medication or there's some therapy, because that's the that's the vibe that we give the world as a field in the mental health. We say that therapy is good and therapy can help people. And so when you have something like this, you think, well, okay, there's just got to be some some therapeutic answer to this, but there there really isn't at least a, a very good one that would work very quickly. You know, I, I would work with families like this and I would work with them 
very intensely for five years. Say the kid is is 13 and now the child is 18. And we would see some changes. But sometimes I wondered if the kid would have just changed naturally anyway because of getting older and maturing a little bit or something. It's just, it can be very, very hard work is the thing. I paid my dues in the beginning of my career. And for those of you that are doing that work, whether you're the foster parents or the adoptive parents or the therapist or the teachers, you are wonderful, wonderful people. And I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for doing that work. Because someone, someone has to do it. And thank you. All right. Well, let's adjourn there. Tune in next time. I'm going to continue watching if you care to. And everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.